Hello, my name is Bo Naz. I'm here to tell you about NASA's vision for in-space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, and rendezvous proximity operations in CAPTURE. I'll refer to these two capability areas as ISAM and RPOC in the remainder of this presentation. ISAM and RPOC support NASA's future goals, predominantly in the explore thrust, with a desired outcome to develop technologies supporting emerging space industries, including satellite servicing and assembly. We envision a future where NASA can procure services such as close inspection, free flyer capture and re relocation, delivery and aggregation of elements and modules in space, maintenance and repair of spacecraft and surface assets, refueling and fluid transfer, and installation and upgrade, for example, of instruments on great observatories or other large NASA vehicles. Finally, we envision a future, perhaps far off, where we manufacture and assemble large purpose-built structures and, and, and systems in space that couldn't possibly be launched from Earth. Our traditional approach is to study, develop, fabricate, and test a system over the course of years or decades, launch it, commission it over a course of a few weeks, and then operate it again for years or decades until either something goes wrong or we no longer need it, at which point we decommission. If we add the ability to assume multiple launches, rendezvous and prox ops capabilities and robotics, we can start to do some additional things. For example, relocation or refueling, remote inspection, or even removal and disposal. If we go one step further and actually think about designing for ISAM early in our mission life cycles and using multiple launches from the beginning, we can also do things such as fueling early in, in commissioning and checkout, using robotics or other systems to aid deployments, and critically, updating, maintaining, repairing, or replacing hardware onboard systems. We can even use uh, Earth return down mass capability to refurbish and refly these systems. Adding the assembly capabilities in blue, we can use multiple launches or in a single launch, aggregate elements, install modules, uh, or assemb assemble structures or large apertures, and assemble or install instruments. Adding manufacturing, we now start with raw material in space and manufacture large infrastructure or parts as part of the early assembly process. Later in life, we can manufacture parts and use them for replacement or repair, and we can manufacture goods in space and return them to Earth for use there. Further, we can recycle and reuse spent derelict spacecraft or material and turn them into the raw material, closing the loop in space. Another important thing to discuss in this area is the concept of interoperability. If we introduce enterprise level requirements or standards early in the process, we can enable use of servicing clients or assembly agents or manufacturing agents for multiple users, enabling interchange of parts between systems and things such as crew rescue. Another concept that's very important in this space is the concept of interoperability. If we add enterprise level requirements and standards early in the design process, we can enable multiple systems to be serviced or assembled or manufactured by the same agents, amortizing the cost of those agents across the different application space. This is really a critical part of ISAM going forward. One more click and we show the in situ resource utilization, which helps us envision a future where we can close the, the loop around all of these systems. ISRU could generate materials that get fed forward into the manufacturing process. Of course, those ISRU functions will require assembly maintenance and repair and replacement, and, and that is a key function going forward of the ISAM capability. So where can we use RPOC and ISAM? Uh, here's a list of enabled and enhanced architectures. We split this into four key areas, including civil space, human exploration and science, uh, commercial, and national security. In order to help us focus on specific use cases, we'll split it into five key areas, two that are predominantly NASA use cases, great observatory servicing and assembly, and human exploration vehicle servicing and assembly, and the other three which are much more widespread in, across the space industry, space fleet, refueling and upgrade, 
platforms and logistics, and active debris remediation. First, Great Observatory Servicing and Assembly. NASA has a rich history of servicing great observatories, starting with the Hubble Space Telescope. Launched in 1990, Hubble achieved world-class science for multiple decades, mainly because we upgraded it. Every few years, a new instrument or, or suite of instruments were delivered to Hubble and installed, making it a brand new observatory. The James Webb Space Telescope was not made to be serviceable, mainly because there was no servicing capability at its Sun-Earth L2 orbit. Roman Space Telescope, which will follow Webb, has been made serviceable. It will be refuelable and could potentially be upgraded. Going forward, our vision is that future great observatories be fully serviceable, especially via planned instrument upgrade. We envision multi-decade, multi-generational, world-class science with these observatories, a return to the planned servicing days from Hubble. Although this time, most likely that servicing will be done robotically at Sun-Earth L2. Other potential use, use cases in the, in the great observatory realm include refuelable or assembled star shades, and even if assembled large telescopes. The key gap for great observatories is the architecture. We don't yet know what the telescope and spacecraft modularity will be to enable servicing. We don't know what the Sun-Earth L2 logistics might look like, and we don't know whether we may use some assembly techniques in the concept of operations during deployment. Other priority gaps pending further definition of the great observatory servicing and assembly architecture include instrument installation and upgrade, especially thermal mechanical alignment and contamination requirements of the instrument systems, modules, and, and, and robotics. We need to advance robotics to operate at the Sun-Earth L2 orbit, including enhanced autonomy systems to, to enable operation with, with extended light time delays. Definition of standards will help us take advantage of existing commercial capabilities and a design of, our, of, a, of the telescope. And finally, most, perhaps most importantly, we need to understand the value proposition of satellite servicing so that we can better define the philosophy for instrument installation frequency. Human exploration has always used servicing and assembly techniques, starting all the way back in Skylab. This great vehicle was made possible by rendezvous from the Apollo docking system and was even repaired in space. Space Shuttle Orbiter was the most prolific servicing and assembly vehicle ever made, spending 133 total missions servicing dozens of spacecraft, including Hubble, and assembling the International Space Station. Obviously, the International Space Station continues to use servicing and assembly techniques and even is producing uh, manufactured goods on board. Going forward, Gateway will similarly use uh, assembly techniques, do docking techniques to assemble the, at the module, at the element level. Commercial platforms will also continue this trend. As we go to the lunar surface, we'll need to take advantage of refueling capabilities to, sus to, to sustain operations. And it's very likely that assembly techniques will be used on, this, on the lunar surface. Mars exploration obviously also requires these capabilities. For example, on en route to Mars, the Mars transportation system will likely require assembly, whether it's a nuclear electric or nuclear thermal system as shown here, and both will require vast amounts of fuel to be loaded in, in orbit. Finally, on the Mars surface, the, the Mars Ascent vehicle, as currently designed, can't land fully loaded, so will likely be refueled on Mars. So where do we go after that? Um, we envision a world where very large scale manufacturing and assembly te techniques enable the construction of platforms, factories, exploration vehicles, etc., far bigger than we could ever imagine today. This chart shows some of the gaps that we might have for human exploration in the servicing and assembly area. As with great observatories, it starts with an architecture gap. We have to understand how we plan to get to Mars, and that means understanding what the drivers are in design of a space nuclear propulsion system, or whatever method we choose in the design of the Mars transportation vehicle. Other priority gaps include surface and in-space docking systems, Mars surface refueling systems, 
and systems for inspection, repair, upgrade, and maintenance of, for example, Mars transportation ships, both en route to Mars, where Earth supplied materials might, may not be available, and back in Earth orbit in preparation for another trip to Mars. Moving on to the more general space servicing and assembly areas, we envision a future where the, where the general space fleet is, is both refuelable and upgradable. These functions aren't only for the exquisite large telescopes and, and platforms. Eventually, modular designs and in-space logistics will enable on-demand responsive spacecraft for planned and unplanned operations. Another area of great general interest <clears throat> is platforms and logistics for in-space use. The International Space Station has hosted payloads since about 2000, including some commercial ISS platforms such as Bartolomeo and NREP. In the future, commercial LEO destinations will continue this trend. The Gateway in cislunar space will also include the ability to host payloads delivered by the Gateway Logistics System and installed by the Canadian robot arm there. Going forward, we envision a future with space tugs, fuel depots, in-space test beds, such as the DIU Orbital Outpost, or this Earth observ Observation Platform. Regional hubs and other large space endeavors are the inevitable future of this ongoing activity. So looking at space fleet refueling upgrade and platforms together, space fleet refueling and upgrade really requires three key things, serviceable clients, commercial servicers, and effective, cost-effective commercial logistics and delivery. We've identified a few gaps in this area, obviously starting with better understanding and coordination of our, of our general infrastructure. Confers and others are working on common interfaces for rendezvous proc stops and capture and for refueling, and we'll need to adopt new standards for power and data interfaces. We've also identified a few, a few key fluid transfer challenges and believe that there will need to be some more in-space demonstrations in order for the client base to adopt this option. The fifth and final use case of the ISAM and RPOC capability areas is active debris remediation. Since about 2010, the debris environment has grown significantly, mainly as the result of some intentional collision events. In 2021, the, the U.S. government issued a National Orbit Debris R&D Plan and followed it in 2022 with an implementation plan. Those plans both call out the need for active debris removal. Our international colleagues in Europe and Japan have initiated activities to demonstrate capabilities for debris removal. This year, the Space Force and NASA both initiated efforts to develop ADR-relevant technologies. SpaceWorks for the Space Force initiated its Orbital Prime program, and, and NASA has solicited technologies through the STMD Ignite SBIR. NASA OTPS also has a cost-benefit analysis study underway, expected to be completed in November 2022. This study will identify prioritized ADR approaches that reduced operational risks and minimized cost in order to focus near-term technology investment. Pending that final report, we envision the key priorities in the ADR area to be capture of large space debris, capture and remediation of small debris, and studies of non-traditional ADR mission concepts and capabilities. For example, just-in-time collision avoidance, responsive post-fragmentation cleanup, and other concepts that could be scalable to bulk remediation. There are also relevant gaps captured in some of the other capability areas. For example, advanced propulsion systems, laser ranging systems, small spacecraft propellantless deorbit devices, and in-space recycling and reuse, which could eventually serve as a source of revenue for active debris remediation. So we presented five use cases for ISAM and RPOC. Let's take a step back and stress where the US government ISAM stakeholders should focus. As we said, there are three things required for ISAM to become a reality. Clients, agents, and logistics. In the area of clients, our priority is to support the U.S. government customer, helping them focus on enterprise-level cost and risk that might be reduced through the use of servicing capabilities. 
focusing on enterprise level cost and risk that could be reduced through the use of ISAM capabilities. We will continue to educate the U.S. government spacecraft buyer, enabling them to make, make their future spacecraft procurements include servicing, serviceability requirements, and helping them to procure on-orbit services. In the area of ISAM agents and logistics, we believe that the key priority is to enable commercial providers. We do that by purchasing services, funding infrastructure and destinations, breaking down regulatory hurdles, and assisting providers by publishing and sharing our, guide, our lessons learned and best practices. We can also fund high risk, high return enabling technology development and demos. The final two charts in this package tabulate our prioritized servicing and assembly and RPOC gaps. We've organized the NASA workforce into 11 roadmap areas for these two capabilities. And these gaps are as prioritized by those teams. The teams are in orbit and surface docking and berthing systems roadmap team, the instrument servicing and installation team, storable and electric propulsion propellant refueling, design for OSAM, in space manufacturing, on orbit and on surface va validation and verification, ISAM robotic systems and hardware, small satellite and ISAM delivery logistics, rendezvous prox ops and docking, the ISAM materials team, the assembly of structures team, and the active debris remediation team. I'll let you study those gaps offline. Be on the lookout for more detail, including solicitations to help us close those gaps. In the meantime, thanks for watching and we'll talk soon.